Flying military aircraft requires the pilot to use all of his perceptive senses. But the most important of these is the sense of sight. Vision is essential in almost every phase of an airborne mission. You use your sense of sight to locate distant objects, and further, to perceive details of shape and color, which enable you to make positive identification. The sense of sight enables you to judge distances to other objects and to recognize movement in your field of view. Reading your instrument panel, reading charts, or identifying landmarks and targets. All require maximum use of your sense of sight. At night, vision is seriously reduced, yet you still must rely on your sense of sight for many of the functions in flight operations. Night flying requires the use of special visual techniques to get the maximum benefit from even normal vision. By understanding how your eyes perform their many complex functions, you can improve your own ability to see. The purpose of this film is to show you how to get the best performance from your own sense of sight. In the process of seeing, the eye performs three basic functions. First is the perception of objects by detecting the light being emitted or reflected from the objects. This is known as light discrimination. Second is the perception of the detail of the objects. This is visual acuity. And third is the judgment of distance and the perception of movement in the field of vision. This is spatial discrimination. Actually, all three of these functions are performed simultaneously, but let's examine each one separately. Light discrimination depends upon the brightness of the object and its contrast with the background area. If the illumination is below certain intensities, the eye will not respond and you see only total darkness. As the level of illumination increases, it reaches a point at which you begin to distinguish large shapes and objects. By increasing the illumination beyond this point, objects become more easily distinguished from their surroundings. Colors become apparent, and details of objects are perceived. A continuing increase in the illumination level has little additional visual effect until the light reaches a point where all vision is lost in a painfully bright glare. The range of light intensities through which normal vision is possible extends from the bright glare of direct sunlight through cloudy daylight, twilight and moonlight, down to the weak intensity of starlight. The way the eye achieves light and color discriminations within this range can be shown by studying the structure of the eye. The human eye is a complex structure that performs all the physiological functions necessary to see. Optically, it can be reduced to four major components the outer transparent coat, which is the cornea, the pigmented iris with its central opening, the pupil, the crystalline lens, and the retina. In several respects, the eye closely resembles the optical system of a camera. In both, there is a lens system whose focus can be changed, a diaphragm which regulates the quantity of light admitted, and a light-sensitive film upon which the image is formed. Light enters the eye through the cornea, passes through the opening of the iris, through the lens, and strikes the surface of the retina. The cornea is the first lens of the optical system and provides most of the refraction or bending necessary to focus the light rays. The iris expands or contracts, controlling the amount of light entering the eye to maintain the most effective exposure to the retina. As light passes through the crystalline lens, it is further refracted to place the image of the observed object exactly in focus on the retina. This process is known as accommodation. The retina contains a layer of photosensitive receptors, which when stimulated by light, send signals to the brain. These receptors in the retina are of two kinds, the cones and the rods. 
cones are receptive to the range of light intensities from sunlight down to bright moonlight. Rods are much more sensitive than cones and are effective from weak twilight down to the level of starlight. Here is how the rod and cone systems perform light discrimination. Each rod contains a photosensitive substance called rhodopsin, or visual purple. Light acts upon this substance, which generates a signal proportional to the amount of light. Since rhodopsin is extremely sensitive, rods detect very weak light intensities that are not sufficient to activate the cones. The weak signals from several rods are picked up by a single nerve fiber which results in an amplified signal to the brain. Rods cannot discriminate between different colors so that all objects seen by rod vision appear in varying shades of gray from black to white. Also, rods are insensitive to red light. Now, you will hear more about this later. While rod vision is in use, the cones are fully sensitive and may be used simultaneously with the rods if stimulated by sufficient light. As the light intensity increases, the rhodopsin breaks down until the rod is completely bleached out, leaving it insensitive to any further light increase. At this point, the light has reached the intensity at which only the cones are active. Cones are believed to contain a sensitive substance called iodopsin, which generates a signal proportional to the light striking the cone. Each cone has its own separate nerve fiber to transmit these signals to the brain. Cones have the ability to discriminate between different colors of light so that the signals contain both intensity and color information. The limit of visual tolerance is the very bright light intensity at which all the iodopsin is bleached out of the cones. Prolonged exposure to such high intensity light can result in permanent damage to the eye. But in normal use, a momentary bright light will cause only temporary loss of vision. After cones and rods have been bleached by bright light, their sensitivity can be returned by regeneration of the iodopsin and rhodopsin. After exposure, regeneration of iodopsin in the cones occurs quite rapidly and vision returns in a few seconds. Cones can be dark adapted to reach their maximum efficiency after only a few minutes in total darkness. However, the regeneration of rhodopsin in the rods requires a much longer time. The ability of the body to regenerate rhodopsin requires a sufficient supply of vitamin A. A properly balanced diet that includes green vegetables, carrots, eggs, butter, liver, and yellow fruits such as peaches will supply this vitamin in adequate amounts. An excess of vitamin A will not improve your vision, but a deficiency will definitely reduce the ability of the eye to reach peak efficiency. Rods will regain some sensitivity in about 15 minutes, but they only reach peak efficiency after about 30 minutes in total darkness. For this reason, in preparation for night operations, you will dark adapt your eyes for at least 30 minutes before flight. Remember that rods are insensitive to red light. Therefore, while wearing the red goggles, the rods are building up rhodopsin to maximum sensitivity. At the same time, the cones are working to permit you to continue all normal activities, such as reading or writing. Carriers are equipped with red light illumination for use during night operations, eliminating the need for red goggles. After your eyes become dark adapted, protect them from exposure to any light except red so as to maintain maximum sensitivity. In the cockpit, Use only low-level red illumination for reading instrument panels and charts. At all times, avoid direct view of bright lights or flame patterns of other aircraft. By maintaining complete rod adaptation, you greatly increase your performance of discrimination of light. At night, visual detection of objects is severely limited by the lack of brightness difference between the object and its background. Discrimination can be improved by sighting objects against contrasting backgrounds. Clouds offer a good background for visual contrast at night. Reflections from water have the same effect. Under twilight conditions, the bright sky areas will provide brightness difference for dark objects, while the dark sky 
gives contrast to bright objects. Under daylight conditions, contrast of colors is the basis for discrimination of objects. Mottled backgrounds tend to obscure objects, while solid color areas provide good visual contrast. At high altitudes, extreme brightness from direct sun and undercast clouds can approach the level of visual tolerance, making vision extremely difficult. Also, reflections from metal surfaces or from the canopy further interfere with normal vision. Use of your tinted eye shade will help to reduce these problems. As long as the field of vision remains within the brightness range of your cone and rod systems, light discrimination will depend solely on the efficient use of your normal vision. The second visual function, the ability to see detail of an object, is visual acuity. You use acuity in recognition of other aircraft, in identifying landmarks, in reading charts. In fact, every time you bring an object into direct, sharp focus, you're using visual acuity. In effect, acuity is the resolving power of the eye. Although the normal field of view of each eye is quite large, you actually perceive fine details in only a small portion of that field. For example, keep your eye fixed on the cross. Now, without moving your eyes, try to identify the detail of any other object in the room around you. Now keep your eye fixed on the cross while other objects are added to your view. Even in this narrow field, you will be unable to see detail in these objects unless you move your eyes to fixate on them. To understand why this is so, we must look again at the retina of the eye and the distribution pattern of rods and cones. The cones are distributed rather thinly around the edge of the retina, but in a small spot near the center, called the fovea, they become extremely dense. Actually, in the fovea, there are more than one quarter million cones in a diameter of about one sixteenth inch. Each individual cone within the fovea has its own direct nerve fiber connection to the brain. Thus, an image sharply focused onto the fovea will be observed in all its fine detail. Viewing in this manner is called fixating. Images which fall outside the fovea are seen in much lesser detail. For this reason, large objects or a large field of view are examined in detail by successively fixating the eye on the various areas. However, in low illumination levels using rod vision, this process is reversed. Detail is lost in the center of the field, while the greatest acuity occurs in the outer areas of the field. To understand this, again look at the retina and the distribution pattern of the rods. There are no rods in the fovea. They are rather evenly distributed outside of this area. Thus at night, when relying on rod vision, if you fixate on an object, it will disappear. To see the object under these conditions, you must use off-center vision. That is, look to one side or above or below the object to place the image on the rods of the retina. Since rods are not as dense as cones and their nerve networks combine, fine detail cannot be readily observed with rod vision. This loss of acuity can be partially compensated by observing the object for a longer time. Slight eye movements away and back to the object will prevent the image from fading. A serious loss of acuity in either rod or cone vision occurs when the image on the retina is in motion. The result is that the object appears as a blur. This usually occurs when the eyes are moving past an object. Scanning by continuous movement of the eye will make it difficult to see the objects in the field of view. Proper scanning technique involves moving the eyes in successive steps across the field, fixating at each step. In a sky search, for example, use a scan pattern by fixating at regular intervals across the field. In this way, you observe each sector with maximum acuity. Small or distant objects that might otherwise be missed will now be easier to see. Scanning at night requires the same technique, except that off-center vision is used, and the time of viewing each sector should be of longer duration. 
To lessen eye fatigue when conducting a long, continuous search, rest your eyes momentarily by closing or blinking rapidly between each complete scan of the field. Since the function of visual acuity is performed differently in day and night situations, careful attention to scanning technique is extremely important. Once an object has been sighted and fixated, you use the third visual function, spatial discrimination, to determine the distance of the object and direction of movement. Motion is best observed by relating objects to some fixed reference in the field of view. The most obvious fixed reference is the ground itself, but in the air, clouds may provide the reference image. Movement along the line of sight toward or away from the viewer is perceived by the progressive change in the size of the image. Depth perception, or the judgment of distance of objects in your field of view, is a function that is performed when the eye transmits subconscious cues to the brain. These cues may be either monocular, requiring the use of only one eye, or binocular cues, requiring the use of both eyes. The first binocular cue is convergence. This is the mental measurement of the muscular action required to converge the two eyes so they fixate on the object. The nearer the object, the more convergence is required. The second binocular cue is stereopsis. Stereopsis results from the fact that each eye sees a slightly different view of the fixated object. Mentally, these views are combined to form an image having depth dimension. Furthermore, other objects in the field will be seen as double images. The more distant ones will appear separated, while closer objects will appear crossed. You are not usually aware of the double image effect, since your brain subconsciously merges the two images. At distances greater than about one-third of a mile, distance judgment is accomplished by monocular cues, which work equally well with either eye. One monocular cue is the relative size of known objects in the visual field. The nearby object appears larger than the more distant object. Another monocular cue is aerial perspective. Nearby objects are seen clearly, while distant objects are less distinct in shape or brightness and tend to lose color. Haze, fog, or smoke will have the same effect. This may cause gross errors in distance judgment. Linear perspective is another common distance cue. Parallel lines such as the edges of the runway appear to converge in the distance. The greater the convergence of these lines, the more distant is the runway. Overlapping contours is a monocular cue often employed to determine relative positions of two or more objects. The partially hidden object is obviously the more distant one. Motion parallax is one of the most commonly observed cues. When you're in motion, nearer objects will appear to move by faster than distant objects. In fact, if you fixate on a nearby object, the farther distant objects will appear to move in the same direction you are moving. These cues of distance judgment are perceived by the eye simultaneously with all the other functions of spatial discrimination, visual acuity, and light discrimination. Together, these functions make up the complex physiological process of vision. But perceiving and conveying this multitude of information is not complete without the brain to interpret the observed information. The brain, in turn, requires the nourishment of the bloodstream to maintain its efficient operation. Any physiological action that impairs the peak performance of the brain will also impair the peak performance of your vision. For example, as you know, hypoxia reduces the cerebral functions so that vision will be seriously impaired. Smoking before flight has a similar effect since it introduces carbon monoxide into the blood, reducing its oxygen carrying capacity. Alcohol in the bloodstream acting as a depressant decreases the ability of the tissues to absorb oxygen. Distance judgment, brightness contrast, and overall size of the visual field are reduced by alcohol. Antihistamines, aspirin, or other drugs may interfere with depth perception, visual acuity, 
and may cause a loss in the muscular coordination of the eye. Don't fly after taking any medicine. Do not take any medicine except as ordered by the flight surgeon. At high altitudes, particularly in unpressurized cabins, nitrogen in the blood may form bubbles which cause hazy vision, scintillating blind spots, and severe restriction of the visual field. Breathing pure oxygen for at least 15 minutes before flight will minimize many of these effects. Certain physical forces encountered while flying will affect your ability to see. For example, positive G can cause graying out or blacking out of vision. And the force of negative G, if great enough, can produce the more dangerous phenomenon of red out. To avoid fatigue, you should get as much rest and relaxation as possible between missions. If you plan to spend a large part of any day in glaring sun, wear sunglasses. Otherwise, if you fly during the night of the same day, it will be difficult to dark adapt your rods because of overexposure to the sun. Another factor that may affect your visual performance in the air is the condition of the windscreen and panels of the cockpit of your aircraft. Windscreens and other translucent panels absorb light and magnify any light within the aircraft, particularly at night. Dirt, grease, or scratches on these panels can be a serious handicap. You must make sure that the windscreen and other transparent panels of the cockpit are kept scrupulously clean. By recognizing all of these factors that would tend to impair normal eyesight, you can take positive steps to keep your vision at peak efficiency. As you have seen in this film, the eye performs three basic functions. Light discrimination is accomplished by the rod and cone systems of the retina. The extreme sensitivity of the rods permits you to see in low intensities of light. However, you must prepare these rods by dark adapting to maximum sensitivity for 30 minutes prior to flight. And further, you must protect this adaptation using your eyes at night. Rod vision requires the use of off-center vision to see detail of objects at night. In day vision, using the cones, visual acuity is achieved by fixating the eye to place the image on the fovea. Scanning an area must be done by successively fixating at separate points. And in a sky search, this is done in a regular pattern. Spatial discrimination is performed by the two eyes working together or by either eye. Distance judgment requires the recognition of various visual cues, which indicate relative or absolute distance of objects. Physiological factors which affect the bloodstream and the brain will have a definite bearing on the efficiency of your vision. In flying aircraft, your eyes are the most important equipment you carry on board. The success of any mission will depend on your ability to perform all the required visual functions. With intelligent use and common sense care, you can obtain maximum performance of your own sense of sight. Thank you.